hopefully for what this evening. Um, so I hope you're all doing well and looking forward to um, study week next week, um, which is a, always something great to look forward to. And plus the, the two bank holidays the week afterwards. So I think everybody hopefully should be in good form today. So I think this is a good uh, a, a good timing. So um, welcome to our second Trinity Inc. Um, and that's the Trinity Inclusive Curriculum Project, Food for Thought, uh, Lunchtime Online Seminar Series. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Rachel Hoare. I'm the Academic Director of the Trinity Inc. Project which is based in the Equality Office in Trinity College. Today's talk is entitled Meaningful Equality, Diversity and Equality in Higher Education Policy. And this will take the form of presentations from Dr. Ross Woods, who is Senior Man Manager for the Higher Education Authority's Center of Excellence for Quality, for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. And our very own Professor Lorraine Leeson, who's Associate Vice Provost for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion here in TCD. This will be followed by a discussion between them and yourselves um, of the issues raised. Um, in addition to our two speakers, I'd particularly like to thank the other members of the Trinity Inc. team. So our project manager, Darina Johnson, our school champion lead, Joanne Banks, and our student partner liaison officer, Sean Adderley, for all of their hard work in bringing this seminar series together. What I'd like to do, first of all, is just to provide you with a brief introduction to the Trinity Inc. project um, before handing over to Ross and Lorraine. Um, I realize some of you know about the project, but I'm assuming as well that some people don't. So it'll just be a very quick um, um, resume of the project so far. Um, Ross and Lorraine will each speak for around 10, 10 to 15 minutes. And after that, we'll open the floor for Q&A. So Doreen is now going to share the screen and uh, we'll get started. It's lovely to see so many of you here. OK, so um, just a quick overview then for the seminar today. And we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. So who are we and what are we doing? Well, as I said, I'm myself. I'm the project director, the academic lead. Dr. Doreena Johnson is the project manager. Sean Adley is the student partner liaison. And then Joanne Banks has also come on board because she's got so much. She's our kind of resident ex ex expert in all things inclusive education. So we're delighted to have her on board as well. We started in October 2020 with funding from the Higher Education Authority. Um, we managed to get a commitment for a further three years funding um, until 2024. We're based in the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Unit as part of the wider EDI agenda at Trinity. And our mission statement is to support the integration of the principles of diversity, equality and inclusion across the curriculum at Trinity. So just to say a little bit more about what that means, because there are many definitions of curriculum, some more narrow and some, some broader. Um, it often has uncertain boundaries. So what we, we, we spent quite a bit of time at the beginning of the project trying to you know, just define what curriculum meant to us here in Trinity. Um, and we see it as the transmission of knowledge, as ends to be achieved, as interaction of teachers, students and knowledge, and as praxis. Um, the intended educational experience in the lecture theater, laboratory or seminar room, plus very importantly, the hidden curriculum in the library, in work placements, um, that's, that's a huge one, um, and, and all of those other um, intended educational experiences. So we're talking about what's to be learned, so the content, why it's to be learned, the rationale and the underlying philosophy, how it's to be learned, the process, and when it's to be learned, so the structure of the learning process. So that's really what we mean by curriculum. Um, we've reflected quite a lot along with our student partners upon possible curriculum exclusions. And most of these, it's really important to say, do occur unwittingly. So there could be barriers to student access and, and engagement. So for example, no plan to support the engagement of students with IT issues. Things like essential field trips may not be considered for barriers due to finance or mobility. Students not able to, um, not, not having access to finance, to enough finance to be able to go on essential field trips. Um, and, and just getting the information out there about specific funds that exist to help these students. Um, the lack of diversity in reading lists and contents, for, for example, homogen homogeneous um, demographic profile of authors or ideas and perspectives, pictures of conditions on white skin only. That's something that's come up with our um, students from um, the Faculty of Health Sciences. They don't see themselves represented in, in the curriculum. Barriers within teaching methods, 
So there could be teaching methods which haven't been evaluated for, po for possible barriers to learning. So for example, students with English as a second language we're seeing increasingly in our classrooms, students with disabilities and inaccessible lecture slides. Um, so we had a presentation yesterday, a little workshop, just a half an hour workshop on this issue. Um, the recording is on our website. So please, if you couldn't attend it, it's definitely wor well worth looking at. Um, so just very small things you can do to make lecture slides more accessible. Academic language, complex terminology, which isn't explained. That's something that we come up with, that we hear from our student partners time and time again. Um, and barriers for students to demonstrate their learning. So here we're talking about assessment, and you know we've got the traditional modes of assessment, um, essay, exam, which really supports only some students' strengths, um, not interrogated for alignment with learning outcomes. And certainly the Trinity electives, many of you will be familiar with who are from Trinity College, their electives, their modules that are available to students across college, um, they are kind of held up as being you know, the best practice in terms of assessment using lots of different methods to, 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 to be able so that students can actually um, show what they've learned in many different ways. Thanks, Serena. So the, the, the Universal Design for Learning, the UDL framework, some of you will be familiar with this. This underpins um, our work. There are three core principles for the design of learning experiences and um, to reduce barriers in the teaching and learning context. So the first one, multiple means of engagement. And how, how do we do that? Well, we're trying to support access to material and, sure, and, and ensuring broad representation, multiple means of representation. So that's where we're presenting information and content in different ways. Um, and then multiple means of action and expression. And that's where we're offering variety and options of assessment type. And the benefits for students is that they feel more represented, more engaged, very importantly, and more able to um, succeed. So for the staff, what's the benefits? We see a more diverse student body, less reliance on individualized supports by college services. When we're talking about inclusion, we're talking about all students for many different reasons, better outcomes, and obviously then um, that will lead into better retention of students. So the project goals are to create an accessible curriculum that supports the engagement, representation, and act action of all students including those from diverse worldviews, cultures and identities, and with different learning backgrounds, abilities and strategies. Um, we want to embed the principles of inclusion in all aspects of the academic cycle across all courses, modules and programmes at Trinity College Dublin. We want to establish Trinity College as a place of belonging and respect for diversity, where all our students feel supported in achieving their learning goals, and to equip students with the quality, skills and behaviours encompassed by the Trinity graduate attribute attributes. Thanks, Serena. So we have four equal and very much interconnected pillars of project initiatives. The first one is academic, um, where we stimulate interest, debate and engagement at the school level. And the action on that is creating a community of practice led by the Trinity Inc. School Champions Programme. So we, we our, our aim is to have a, a champion from every school and college. We're not quite there yet. We've got 18 um, champions um, from 16 schools out of 24 schools so we're doing pretty well um, and we so we meet with those school champions once a month they've also um, completed training um, in, in universal design for learning and are engaged in all kinds of really interesting and innovative activity within their own schools then we have the student pillar um, which is all about awareness raising of inclusion challenges successes and also co and recreation of curricular components um, and the action there is collaboration and partnership with students led by the Trinity Inc. Student Partner Programme. I think we're, we're, we're adding to the, our number of student partners all the time. I think currently we've got about 20, but we are in a recruitment phase at the moment for postgraduates. Um, so that may well have gone up in the last day, actually. So um, we had a student partner programme, um, which we ran over the summer, a summer student partner programme, which we run over the summer. And I'm going to show you some of the um, outputs from that in a second. And then we've got the institutional um, pillar, which is where we're looking for buy-in and promotion by university leaders, um, where we want to see inclusivity embedded in college policies and discourse. Um, so it's a three-year project. We want to make sure that it's sustainable, that we've embedded all of these principles in, um, in, in, in our policies um, in college. So that includes module, course descriptions, um, ex external examiner reports. Um, so that, that's the kind of area I'm involved in at the moment, um, and we're making really good progress there. Um, and then the infrastructure is kind of like a wraparound pillar, capacity across college to meet support needs of all students. So there we're collaborating with the, the services 
um, the obvious services of the Trinity Access Programme, disability, student counselling, but also the library, um, Healthy Trinity. Um, we, we actually met with over 50 stakeholders in the first, um, the first, around the first 12 weeks of the project. Thanks, Tarina. So insights from students. So these were um, just to give you a flavour and these are all available on our website and we'll put the website address in the chat for any of you who are interested. So we ran a student partner programme across the summer and where we, we talked to the students on a weekly basis. Um, we ran two sessions a week. Um, to uh, and, and to see what their kind of to, I suppose to gather does gather together their insights of different things which they had found exclusionary, um, but also inclusive in college. So good practices and bad practices, and then we asked them to produce some output um, that would be useful for academic staff. So you can see there in the bottom right hand corner, there's a, that's just the kind of top half of a poster how to be a trans ally in the classroom, and I know that that's been printed numerous times and is, is, is being used in certain schools. Um, so that's just, you know, telling us how to, I suppose, from a um, transgender perspective about how, how we need to address students, talking about pro pronouns, um, all those kind of things that some of us might feel quite uncomfortable with sometimes or just might be very ignorant about. So that, that's been a really interesting, uh, really, really useful piece of work. The bottom left there, and I really urge you to, if you do nothing else um, on our website to, to engage with this podcast, there's a podcast um, which was produced by two black um, Muslim women students about inclusivity in Trinity. Um, I'm just going to quickly read this out because it's so powerful. Walking into a lecture hall, there was definitely preconceived ideas that most people had, including the lecture about me as a black person and even groups of black people as well and even me as a black Muslim woman as well. I'm studying nursing and we learn about different illnesses and I never see pictures of black people and people of colour. We never learn about how certain illnesses might present in people of colour and I just feel like in that instance we're feeling not included, othered and as if us being represented within healthcare or within the curriculum is not important. Um, so very interesting conversation there um, in the form of a podcast that's on our website and between the two black Muslim students um, um, gave us huge amount of insight and awareness into that student experience. Um, the top right hand corner there, you've got um, mature students. Some mature students did um, a survey. These were the, the takeaways. The best lecturers are the ones that talk with the students and not at us. Um, I just think that's so important for everybody, not just mature students. Videos they like. Um, more online learning so for obviously for mature students that flexibility that being able to you know not being able to get to a lecture maybe because you've got to take the kids to school or you've got other caring responsibilities whatever the the reason might be to be able to then to access it later on flexible deadlines um, and then um, the top um, the, the, the one in the top left hand corner there I'm just going to read out the, the kind of key takeaway by actively listening to student needs and feedback we can work together to make college more accessible and inclusive so that was just looking at a number of different things like around deadlines and flexibility for students as well. So achievements and current aims and activities. So as I said, we've got 18 school champions recruited. That's ongoing. We have monthly me meetings, engagement portfolios for each school, professional learning development module. We've got student partners, 20 currently recruited, monthly meetings, training and other opportunities. And we are now starting to engage more with the postgraduate community. We're recognizing um, how important that is, and especially in the context of the postgraduate renewal program, which is currently being rolled out. So um, we're trying to and make sure that we cover the whole of the um, of, of the student population. We're doing this monthly public talk series. Um, the advisory board, we also have a advisory board. We meet once a semester and we obviously we have ongoing consultation with members of the advisory board, depending on different issues that come up for us and different things that we want to explore. Um, inclusive, inclusivity section has been included in elective proposals. Um, currently looking at course for proposals, external examiners reports, as I've already mentioned. So now when somebody puts forward a, 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 a new elective, they have to demonstrate that they have thought about um, issues of inclusion um, um, in, in, in their proposal. And I've, I'm, I'm a member of that committee and I've, I've seen this actually coming through um, in the proposals and it, it, it does make people really think about that. So these are the kind of things that we're trying to do to get it embedded. Um, Communications, we're trying to up our communications and our, our online um, social media presence, inter internal digital screens and external via, via social media um, and um, the website. So thanks a million. That's just a very quick whistle stop tour of the project. Please do um, have a look at the website if you want to um, have any more information or if you want to get involved, please do email, email us as well or the um, information is there.
So thank you for that. I'm going to now um, introduce you to Ross Woods. Um, so as I've already said, he's the Senior Manager of the Higher Education Authority's Centre of Excellence for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. He has led the HEA's work on gender equality and other areas of equality, diversity and inclusion since June 2019. This has included initiatives um, such as the Senior Academic Leadership Initiative, the first ever report on race equality in Irish higher education, and more recently work to address sexual violence and harassment in higher education institutions. That's my great pleasure to welcome Ross. Hand over to you, Ross. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I'm just going to try and share my screen. Um, and I'm hoping the right one pops up. Let's see. That's all right. Okay, good. Um, let me see. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, as as um as Rachel just said, uh, my my role in the HEA is um basically the the head up our work on equality, diversity, and inclusion across the higher education system. So, what I think I might do is I'll just give a quite a quick presentation here, which gives an overview for you on the work that the HEA is doing in this area, and um try not to take up too much time with that and then i know lorraine has a presentation and then maybe we can open up um much more um to questions and answers because i think that's much more productive in this type of space um so uh, ba basic at the moment we're the center of excellence for equality diversity and inclusion but just to give a background to our, our existence Originally, the centre was established very specifically as a, as a centre of excellence for gender equality. Um, and this was a recommendation in the then Department of Education and Skills Gender Action Plan in 2018. And, and you can see here, I've just popped down the, the rationale for why. And um, the reason that we were established was to, and, and I'm sure um, everyone will love the um, the wording around this was, was to ensure sustainable acceleration towards gender equality in Irish higher education institutions. And I'm still trying to figure out what um, sustainable acceleration looks like, um, particularly <laughs> with all the discussions around climate change and the price of uh, petrol th uh, these days. But anyway, this is what I've been tasked with doing um, and how we were we were asked to do this was was to, by acting as a, as a centralized support to institutions so it's, and particularly to to staff like um lorraine who are who are leading on the edi work within our institutions um to share good practice and you know pinpoint what was happening in different institutions and bring people together because one of one of the things we've seen in equality diversity and inclusion work uh, and it's I think reflected by your attendance here today and to see the buy-in uh, into the Trinity Inclusive Curriculum, but that in this particular area of work in higher education, we see less competition and, and much more collaboration and people try to work together because really what we're trying to do is affect the positive change for everyone. So, so, there's, so it's, it's basically learning from each other and working with each other uh, and you know enabling these joint initiatives and cooperation between higher education institutions and I suppose we've a, we've a broader remit where we try to look at you know what works and what doesn't work and, and I suppose a lot of you will be familiar with, with things like the Athena Swan Charter and we, we tried particularly over the last number of years to adapt the charter to take on board the, the criticisms that we're hearing on the ground and to make it work better for staff in institutions um, um just the, really the most important thing here, um, as I said, we do work closely with the institutions, but what, what I really just wanted to put here was that in August 2020, when Minister Harris became the first um, the first full cabinet minister for higher education, um, he expanded the remit of the centre to cover all areas of equality, diversity and inclusion, uh, and as well as oversight of, of what's called the framework for consent in higher education institutions which which some of you may be aware of but basically there's a broad quite a broad area of work that we're we're involved in at the moment in the center um as i said the main thrust of it was gender equality starting with the the hga 
review of gender equality in 2016, which you can see in the top left hand corner there, the department's own gender action plan, the efforts to implement the Athena Swan Charter. Um, we annually publish uh, staff data by gender. But in, more, in the last year, we, we've published two uh, and really in the last six months we've published two um quite important studies which we hope will shape um a move into broader areas of, of of inclusion and equality so one was on race equality in the higher education sector um and the other was on the experiences of staff and students in relation to sexual violence and sexual harassment and we just stop a little bit around the race equality piece because um, one of the key issues we have in terms of the equality work is gathering sufficient data to be able to evidence issues that we're seeing in various areas. And we've been quite successful. And one of the reasons why the early focus and, and the main focus to date has been on gender equality is because gender is the only area where we have really good data in terms of staff. Um, higher education institutions across Ireland um, have yet to gather um, really comprehensive data in relation to staff by ethnicity uh, and also in other areas of uh, protected characteristics such as disability, sexual orientation and so on. So we can't actually pinpoint what the issues may or may not be in those areas. Although anecdotally, we do know that there, there, there are a lot of issues and, and the report that we published on race equality really focused much more on looking at these issues from a, a qualitative perspective and, and try to gather the lived experience of staff rather than um, look at it from a purely quantitative perspective. So all that said, as was the date, the three main areas that we've worked on are gender, race and ethnicity, and then um, sexual violence and harassment in, in higher education. So just a quick overview of the gender equality piece and we'll share this these slides with Dorina afterwards and she can share them with you and as you'll see I've, I've put links into all of the the various pieces of work that, that we've undertaken which may may or may not be of interest to you Um, some of the things that I haven't touched on there in relation to gender equality for the senior academic leadership initiative which was a, which was a focused um positive action initiative to try and increase the number of female um, staff at senior levels in the institutions. We've seen some progress there. We were at about 20% of professors in universities were female um, five or six years ago, and we're up to nearly 28% now. So we've seen a significant increase in that, and, and it reflects, I suppose, work that's going on across Europe as well in universities. And then we have a gender equality enhancement fund, which supports um, smaller projects kind of seeds projects in gender equality and, and recently we've actually um funded a project which looks at um embedding uh gender equality into the into the curriculum so it kind of feeds into the work that um the trinity inclusive curriculum is doing here um this so is one of the kind of um big pieces of news is that we will actually launch um a follow-up to the initial review of gender equality um this month um and the hope is that when we, we run this review, we'll start to take, um, I suppose, a more inclusive view of gender equality. This was one of the issues with the 2016 review, and um, the review was a very comprehensive baseline look at gender equality in Irish higher education. Something like that had never been done before, but it didn't take a, a fully inclusive uh, approach to gender equality. It didn't look at the intersection of other protected characteristics with gender, uh, and, and it was quite narrowly focused on, on, on female staff, I guess. So we're hopeful that we'll, we'll have a much more inclusive um, approach to the review this time around. Because that brings me, I suppose, to the work on race equality. Um, as I said, we published the report, um, which I suppose basically reinforces what we've been hearing anecdotally, that staff from minority, minority ethnic groups um, are less advantaged, I suppose, in the higher education space in terms of their earning power, in terms of their seniority, in terms of their um, progression opportunities and so on. Uh, and we'll be looking at, at developing an implementation plan, uh, which we're actually developing one at the moment, which will hopefully have tangible um, impact in terms of how we change the experiences of staff from minority ethnic groups in the Irish 
higher education institutions. And then um, another key thing that we've done is look at the collection of um, data by ethnicity. As I said, we have some institutions who, who are still for their entire staff cohort record ethnicity as unknown. So there's a big piece of work there that we're quite win interested in at a national level, which is in encouraging staff to uh, volunteer, voluntarily disclose um, on equality monitoring data. So, so uh, and to kind of reassure staff that this isn't the, there's nothing nefarious about the need to collect this data, but rather it will help us to, to, to develop better policies around uh, equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, the other piece of work that was we were very specifically asked to engage in this work by the minister, um, and a lot of you would probably have seen last year, there was a survey uh, of staff and students on um, their experiences of sexual violence and harassment, and, and reports on those were published uh, just in January, and some very worrying uh, findings in those, those reports, particularly around them. Um, experiences of female staff in, in terms of sexual harassment in, in the institutions. But um, this was one of the positive pieces that came out of that was there was a real willingness of staff to engage in these initiatives and, and talking to Darina um, before um, the seminar today. Um, it seems that there's a similar interest and a similar commitment from staff to engage in, in the inclusive curriculum project. So, so what we're seeing is that staff are really interested in this area and, and want to engage and want to be, I suppose, empowered to engage. So, so the HEA is very supportive of, of, of that approach. So really, that leads me to end on kind of what are, what are our plans nationally. Um, as a center of excellence for equality, diversity, and inclusion. As I said, we, we've really looked at three areas, gender, because that's where the data was, um, consent and ending sexual violence, because we've, we've kind of, this has been highlighted at a government level as, as an area of, of concern. And then race equality, really, because that we were asked to do that work by the institutions themselves, because um, really this was, um, staff on the ground like Lorraine and Siobhan are, are trying to get um, ethnicity data and, and I suppose there's a role there for the HEA to play to kind of assuage any fears that that staff have around giving that data and also to um, counteract the, the cries of GDPR which seem to imply that data protection is more important than equality and there's a big piece of work to be done there so I suppose the future plans are to move into other to look at other air protected characteristics, but perhaps not to look at each area um, discreetly and rather to try to make the equality work that's already happening much more inclusive. So rather than have a review for every protected characteristic that we, we would look at um, leveraging the good work that's been done, say, around gender equality and make sure that those policies aren't just focused on, 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 on a gendered perspective, but rather would uh, benefit staff from all ethnicity, sexual orientations, if staff have disabilities and so on and so forth. So it's it, it, the, the vision for the future is a much more, um, I suppose, a much more inclusive uh, approach to, develop, to quality, diversity and inclusion. Um, so I'll leave it there. Uh, Thank you, Ross. Just wait for you to stop sharing. Thank you so much for such a comprehensive overview. And I'm sure we'll be delighted to hear all the, all the, all the, all the really interesting and very necessary work that's going on. Um, and also the intersectional piece, which came across very loud and clear, plus the, the data collection. And I know this is something that Lorraine will probably mention because this is something we're up against um, all the time as well here in the EDI unit. So thank you. And um, there was a question in the chat there. Just, I'll just ask you now, and um, one of our school champions was asking, are you um, talking about all staff or just academic staff? Yep, I was just about to re um, reply to that. No, all staff. So all the data, the data that we collect is um, academic staff and what, what uh, we term um, uh, professional and um, support staff is uh, uh, professional and management and support staff I think is the, the terminology we use but it, it, that's a bigger piece of work because there's more work has been done in, in relation to academic staff and academic staff pathways but um, something that's something that we're certainly concerned about is um, 
the pathways for staff who aren't academic staff and, and how they can be supported to advance and, and, and not be left behind. Because I know there's often a kind of, uh, uh, there's, a, there's an issue there on parity of esteem, but, but certainly um, when we talk about staff, we talk about everyone. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks for clarifying that, Ross. So now I'm going to attend to uh, Professor Lorraine Leeson, and she's the Associate by Provost, Vice Provost for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion in Trinity College. She took on this role in September 2021. Um, prior to that, she served as Associate Dean of Research at Trin in Trinity College. So she was also the inaugural director of the Centre for Deaf Studies and served in this role from 2001 to 2018. She's also a first generation Leaving Cert student and first generation third level student from the North Inner City. And she completed her master's and PhD while working full time with a background in linguistics, sign language interpreting and deaf studies and an international reputa reputation in the areas of sign linguistics and interpreting studies. Lorraine is passionate about inclusivity and access for all. So delighted to introduce you to Lorraine and um, I'll hand you over now. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much. Do you know what? It's so lovely to talk to you all. And it's so hard to know when you're coming to one of these events, who will be the constituent members. And sure, if I'd known it was going to be all of you, I suppose we would have taken a whole different starting point and we could have just talked about strategy from the get go. Right. But and it would be great if we were all in a real room, wouldn't it, to, to sort of bounce some ideas around a table. But I do have a few slides and uh, let me make sure I open the right thing. And, uh, and let's see if these are helpful at all. So Rachel very kindly um, gave the backdrop to the Trinity Inclusive Curriculum. And I would be a fool if I even tried to add anything to that because there are more of you in the room with more experience, both in the area of, of inclusive education and in terms of the Trinity Inclusive Curriculum project than, than I could uh, add to. So I should be learning from me on that. Um, but I think, you know, it might be worth just starting, if I can, with the higher level piece that, that, that sits within and responds to a degree to what Ross was saying about the, the work in the HEA that's underway. Because in the college community, of course, you know, we have our own strategy. We have our distributed approach to, to what we're doing and what we have done. And that allows for brilliant opportunities for ideas to, to rise up. But we don't exist in a vacuum. We're not just one university. We're in a broader society. We're in a sectoral response environment. And we're also part of, like, you know, from a, from a Trinity perspective, we're a member of Coimbra and we're also a member of the League of European Research University. So we're, we're being informed by those conversations and also responding to them and co-constructing the way forward together. And I think, you know, that if we sort of keep uh, that bird's eye view in parallel or in tandem with what it is that we're trying to do, together in the college and figuring our way forward, well, then that's helpful. So, I mean, from that, the college perspective, you know, it's, it's really striking that in the, the college strategy, we talk about how we want to be one Trinity community. Uh, and that's, that's something that's really resonated with me. And I've been thinking an awful lot about it um, since I, I took on this role last September. And, the, the college strategy explicitly says that we're going to make equality, diversity and inclusion a cornerstone of our ethos and practice across all, across all aspects of college life. So, of course, that necessarily uh, entails curriculum change, curriculum development, but also extracurricular and not just curricular, because our goal has to be about being one community and one community for everybody who walks in through that front arch or indeed through the Lincoln Gate or any other entry point that we have on campus or in the more um, remote parts, because we shouldn't forget also that we have a we have a campus presence in Belfast, we have campus presences in the hospitals, um, out in St. James's, out in Tala. And it's, you know, I think it's really important that when we're thinking about what it is that we're trying to achieve, that we think about that diversity of experience, the diversity of disciplinary know-how, but also then the, the diversity of the individuals who come together, both as students and staff, to try and make that happen. Since I took on the role uh, and in talking with many of you, 
one of the key things that keeps coming up from the many conversations that we've had and from focus groups that have been run by different parts of college around different things that link to EDI related principles is that underpinning notion, that conceptual underpinning of belonging. And a second, I should say, and Ross, you're going to, if you, if you weren't remote, you'd probably kick me under the table, because of course the second thing is resourcing, right? So, so where does the resourcing come from to help us do the work that's required in order to facilitate this sense of belonging? I'm glad that you can't kick me under the table right now. Um, but the Trinity Inclusive Curriculum Project, I think, really supports those higher level goals and that that work towards ensuring we have this sense of belonging for the students and staff who are, are working collaboratively in this space and they do that by their deliberate intentional inclusion of the principles of EDI in the work that they do. I think that when we're, we're engaging in this work also it's so important to make visible the invisible uh, very often, you know, when we're talking about that sense of belonging, people have said things like, you know, we feel that we are coming from the margins, but sometimes where we are placed physically in the campus is on the margins still. So, you know, thinking about the, the psychology of how we respond to people, as well as the, the practical things that we're doing is very, very important. And I think that the having this very serious all college conversation about how do we deliberately and intentionally work to change our curricular practices, our, our educational delivery is extremely important because it is a, a very visible way of demonstrating that we take this work seriously and that we are committed to change. Now, a couple of like this, this slide, of course, we'd have to, we have to, Ross, when you're here, we have to tell you how we rank, you know, we're, we're doing very well, thanks a lot, in terms of uh, gender equality. We've, we've done very well in terms of the, the sustainable de development goals in the 2020 rankings, we were ranked third. And there's been a ton of change. I mean, you've talked Ross, about the changes that are afoot with the HEA and how there's this move from focus on gender equality through to that broader sphere of equality grounds and how you're starting to explicitly articulate them and cross-reference them. And of course, in, in the college, um, the EDI office was established only formally in 2020, but that doesn't mean that nothing happened before then, of course. You know, in parallel with what you said about the gender equality drive, there had been that drive through um, the work of people like Eileen Drew and colleagues to establish the, the Wiser Centre and then the Trinity Centre for Gender Equality and Leadership. And, and it's that work that the EDI um, office has been based upon. And of course, we've had for a very long time, and we're lucky to have here with us uh, the chair of our Equality Committee, Professor Fintan Sheeran today. Um, but the committee, the Equality Committee is a compliance committee of board. And one of the things that we are working to do is to, to, to see how we can best ensure that the work we're doing across the college, um, I suppose the way to think about it is we want to wrap our arms around all of the brilliant, but sometimes dispersed and sometimes siloed work on EDI that happens across the college. And in fact, I think that the Trinity Inclusive Curriculum is one way of doing that because it is cross-cutting. It is deliberately and intentionally born intersectional, if you like. Um, and I think that we can learn an awful lot from the approach that has been taken there. You talked a little bit, oh, I think I might have, did I jump a slide? Um, yeah, I did. So diversity in Trinity, you know, we, we also um, have a very diverse college community. Um, the college has been growing over time. We were told just yesterday, myself and Siobhan in a meeting, that this year for the first time, we've gone over the 20,000 student number mark. And when you think, last night I was at the... Um, the, the, the women graduates in Trinity centenary celebration. And they were talking about in the 1970s, there were about two and a half thousand students on campus. So that shift 
over a relatively short period of time is quite extraordinary. And the, the fact that we are continuing to actively engage with, reflect on what we do and seek to respond to that in meaningful ways is important. Um, I've shown up here the Ableism in Academia in Ireland report that our colleagues from the Trinity Forum for Disabled Staff and Postgraduate Students prepared last year and Rossi very kindly engaged in the launch of that. And I think it's important to reference disability here and I'm glad that you did too, Ross, because too often uh, and this is what our, our colleagues say too, too often when people consider EDI, they don't include disability in that consideration. And it's so important that we do center that there and certainly something that I'm committed to do. For those who are interested in college, we do have an annual, um, Oh, somehow this keeps jumping, an annual equality monitoring report that is available on, on the website. So you can have a peek at that if you want to see how we're doing across a number of, uh, of, of areas and uh, in terms of, say, student numbers, staff numbers, promotions, etc. But as Ross said, the problem is that if we don't have reliable data sets, if, if, and in college what that means is that staff need to proactively go into their core HR portal and select to identify themselves on a range of categories. It's all by invitation. And, and you know, you get to decide what you want to tell us or not. Um, you know, again, as Ross said, it's not for nefarious purposes, but what we monitor, we can measure. And when we want to measure change and benchmark how we're doing, we really do need to have good, reliable um, data to underpin that work. So if any of you haven't done that yet, one of my asks would be, would you go into the core portal and add your detail? Now, we've learned a little bit about coming back to the, the Trinity Inclusive Curriculum Project. You know, it's really impressive to see how that uh, student partnership approach is built in from the get-go to this links I think this approach is one that has been adopted now in a number of instantiations and in different college initiatives so we see it in the brilliant work that's been done around consent with the T together consent program um, from the students union with the counselling service and and with the senior tutors area we see it in the trinity ability co-op with the disability support services and we see it here beautifully articulated through the trinity inclusive curriculum project and i think that that partnership approach has to be the way we go forward you know it, it really is if we take that broader idea of nothing about us without us well then it has to also be instantiated in terms of that student staff relationship uh, as well as in that sort of broad broader uh, inclusivity across the range of equality grounds. Uh, Rachel said, and she sent this to me to say how broadly they had uh, engaged and going back to that idea of it being a cross cutting project that engages with the, the broadest scope of college, that just gives you a snapshot of what that looks like. And of course, as we said at the beginning, there's close alignment between the Trinity Inclusive Project and the uh, college's strategic plan. Where does that fit though in terms of, so we're sort of doing the whole, the whole world, the university, Trinity Inc, and now back up another level. Last September, when I stepped into the role, I thought that this might be the EDI landscape. And you can see that the, the Trinity Inclusive Project certainly sits in there. But as we've learned over the past few months, as Siobhan and I have been uh, trying to, to lay out the, the lay of the land in order to figure out what we want to cover in our EDI strategy, which is where we're going to next, um, we've realized that it's a little bit more complicated and this is an incomplete mapping. Um, you know, I know I see here today colleagues from um, uh, from global engagement, from the sports centre. We've also had brilliant engagement and lots of interest from people from the research institutes across college. So this idea of what can we do better to make people, regardless of the walk of life that they come from, feel that they not only have a right to be included in college, but a space where they can flourish and lead. Uh, because that's really where we want to go, isn't it? It's not just about saying you can come in the door. You have to be able to put your 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 feet up on the, the, 
the armchairs and you have to be able to say, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to actually influence the direction of travel. I don't just want to be here to hear what everybody else has to say. That's not good enough. So what we're trying to do with this, this is just to give you a sense that we are actively uh, engaging in a process of documentation of EDI as the landscape in the college. And from that, in the next couple of months, we're going to engage further in conversations with the uh, assistance of some of our, our Leru and more local uh, EDI colleagues to get that bird's eye view of where we're at and to see where we're going. But we will look along the way, we will be able to draw on the brilliance of the, the uh, Trinity Inclusive Curriculum uh, project and use that, I think, as a great case study for how we want to replicate other EDI activities as we go forward. So I should probably stop there and see if anybody has anything that they, they want to, to add or say or ask Ross. Where's the money, <laughs> Ross? No, that's unfair. Where can we where can we get the resourcing to do all this brilliant work that we want to do? Thanks, Lorraine, for giving us such a comprehensive update there and overview of what you've been doing since September. I, I, have you actually managed to sleep at all? <laughs> um, so, yeah. can we see then if anybody has any questions, reflections, anything they want to say, ask? Clinton? Yeah. Hi, and, and thanks, Ross, and thanks, Lorraine, for very, really inspiring and really informing as informative as well. And thanks, Rachel, for your introduction at the beginning. Um, I, I suppose there's one thing coming from a professional um, um, discipline. I'm uh, Ross. I'm I'm head of the School of Nursing and Midwifery. Um, we have a very diverse student uh, community within our school. Um, but we have our students tend to go out, out of the HEI setting, and this happens in a lot of other uh, uh, professional uh, areas, and they enter into other spaces. And as much as we try and build the EDI uh, structures and supports and, the, and the, the respect and dignity within the HEI setting, we have no nest control, if, if that's the right word, or, or, or no oversight to ensure that, that they're the curricular part, which is outside the college. Uh, is the same experience. And to, from my reading of it, the, the HEA, HEA is there, but there are other, other governmental bodies and other governmental departments which really need to be linking together to ensure that if, if it's not already, well, it doesn't seem to be happening based on what students are telling me, it, in some way making sure that the, that the students, when they move out of the HEI, actually experience things which are of the same quality as we'd like them to experience. I don't know if that's making sense. Yeah, so, so you're talking about placements and when they're kind of like learning on the job, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's no, it's and it's a really um, it's a really interesting point, Fint, and it's not something which um, it's it's not something I guess I've come across before, but I can completely understand that. Um, uh, I mean, there there is like in the it, in terms of Athena Swan, for instance, um, you know, we come across that slightly in in relation to who's eligible to apply so if and, and that's really what you're what you're because for instance science foundation ireland centers are not eligible to apply because they draw their staff from various institutions therefore the staff are working under different hr and so on and, so on, and policies and procedures and so on which is kind of the situation that you're just describing here in terms of the placements but um I don't, I, I guess it all comes down to funding and how those roles are funded. And I mean, they are state funded. Um, the people who are teaching them on, on the job outside of the the academic setting and, and are, are state employees and should be beholden to the same policies that um, are in place within the institution. But I, I completely understand what you mean about how, how far the oversight goes and what you can do to um to look at it. But I, I mean that it certainly sounds like something that would be an interesting project to to look at and to maybe um focus on. I, I, I think I would say that um embedding ADI in the curriculum is not is is not something which has been 
focused on at a national level to the same extent because I, I guess because of the the extent of issues that we came across in terms of edi and staff and, and so on and um, it's not something that's been focused on but it certainly is becoming more and more an issue and, and as you know trinity are leading on it in many ways with with the inclusive curriculum but there are other um institutions with us which are starting to pay more attention to it and i mean lorraine had the the big um uh, slide there with all the different areas and i've been having conversations about how how we expand without losing focus and, and so on and i think that um looking at things like the public sector duty and the human human right, the equality and human rights um duty basic are things which may help us in terms of, of so it may be an embedding of human rights within the curriculum as opposed to because then the hta are given directives and are setting policies but there's very little statutory ba basis for what we're doing at the moment um so actually leveraging other equality policies may, may be the way to go and i mean if it's purely fit to the question of how do you make them do what they're supposed to be doing i always find waving a statute or a piece of legislation at people it makes them kind of uh, respond a little bit quicker so I don't know if that answers any of your questions, but that's just kind of off my head. No, thanks, Ross. That's very, very helpful. But I think it's something we need to keep on on the agenda. Um, and I'm sure Rachel and 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 uh, Dervla, uh, uh, will as well. Thanks. Thank you very much. Can, um, can I just make one little uh, comment there on that, Rachel? And it might be of some use for um, attendees to note. And Fintan, it follows up on your point uh, ahead. Uh, the Association for Higher Education Access and Disability are currently undertaking a project uh, on reasonable accommodations <clears throat> and professional placements. Um, and that uh, project, which I'm working on, uh, wish ahead, uh, is looking at some of those aspects in terms of uh, disability around disability. Um, so, I, and I, I do know culture and um, EDI is coming up strongly in in some of that data. Uh, so, I mean that, that report should be launched um, in the summer uh, or early in the next semester. So uh, that uh, there might be some useful data from that to, to bring forward, uh, to look at how students are transitioning from the college, like Fintan mentioned, into the mm -hmm. professional environment and how the uh, culture uh, and in terms of EDI uh, is affecting that. But it, it, obviously that's only one part of it. Um, so it's just something for people to note that will be coming down the pipeline later. Thank you. Thanks so much, Vivian. Um, Mandy, you had your hand up. Yes, thank you so much for this uh, seminar and this opportunity to learn from both Ross and Lorraine. Um, so I just want to say, I'm sorry for I cannot actually use my camera at this moment, but um, just to say that I am a staff member of, of ethnic minority background, and it is good to hear that there are so many initiatives and policies aimed at improving EDI for, 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 for students, but also in terms of staff support as well, I think. Um, but I, I think what I'm kind of trying to grapple with is this uh, link between policy and practice. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, like, you know, what kind of actual supports may there be for um, staff members who want to connect with um, also students of ethnic minority backgrounds within the college community. For example, I, I'm, I'm from Hong Kong originally, and there is a proposal for a Hong Kong society to be established. Now, obviously, that goes under the CSC. And, you know, and that that is a proposal that is, uh, how can I say, that was initially refused, and then we made a uh, 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 we made a response to and we're waiting on the answer for that but what i'm trying to say is more generally um um when when we were listening to um you know comments from students about like you know having more representation in uh in, in the classroom or you know the way in terms of in terms of teaching materials etc how could we bring this into effect how can we how can we align people who are already um, you know, with from, from DDI backgrounds to be more involved in, in I suppose, um, helping college became a more inclusive environment. Um, it, it's, I, I mean, at the moment, I think what I, for example, what I do, it, a, a lot of it is through kind of informal networks, um, through informal networks. And I would like to be able to 
um, work more with other colleagues also, um, you know, on, on how we can actually make Trinity a more inclusive environment, not just on an individual kind of grouping or because I happen to be from a Hong Kong community, but actually to say, um, is there ways for us to actually link with each other, um, you know, staff members who, who are from ethnic minority backgrounds, we can maybe come up with initiatives and just strategies the way um, initiatives and strategies have been kind of concentrated under the INC umbrella. So that's just a, a, a general comment. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mandy. Does anybody want to respond to what Man? I know Mandy and I were in touch a good while ago. Um, Sure, I, I, have, I have a couple of thoughts actually, Mandy, and thank you for that. So one, one of the, the thoughts is that uh, the, the Vice Provost for Global Engagement is extremely interested in ensuring that, that this concept of belonging is one of the underpinnings of the new global engagement strategy. And so I think it would be definitely, I know Louise was here earlier on, she had to leave, but uh, it would certainly be worth us linking in with them on that point and saying that if that is something that, that staff and students feel needs to happen or have some support around, that we could explore whether they could build that into their own action plan. It might also be something that we mirror in our, our own EDI uh, action plan in terms of our strategy. Um, but also I just, one of the things I had meant to say, but didn't, um, but I will say now is that uh, coming soon, there is a report from the Racial and Ethnic Equality Working Group report um, following from some focus groups that happened last late last summer. Uh, so that report will be coming before the end of this term, hopefully. And we'll see that there are some suggestions and recommendations that come from that forum uh, that we also will hope to bring forward. And that may segue with what you said there, Mandy. So I, I think we should certainly keep that point of conversation open. And there may also well be stuff that Darina or, or Rachel um, can offer in, in terms of suggestions to True Trinity Inc. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, does anybody else have the hand up? I can't necessarily see everybody. So is there, there. Okay, go ahead. Oh, thanks. Um, and Mandy, thanks for that. That's a really important area around staff support and staff networks. And certainly we are looking at that and, and trying to gauge actually from some of our, our neighbours and colleagues um, through our networks and in the UK about how best to build and sustain and resource staff networks. Um, I think that's really important. So thanks for flagging it. And the thing I just wanted to do is to thank Ross as well, too, because um, he always has had an open door to us since I've arrived and landed into this acting role and been really incredibly helpful. And it took really active part in our launch of our ableism academia report as well, too. And is always up for joining us and having difficult conversations and having questions put to him. So we really appreciate that, Ross. And we really hope that that continues as well to um, a, a really cl strong collaborative working relationship with you. So thanks. Thanks for that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Siobhan. We'd, we'd like to echo that as well from the project's perspective. Um, and I know I actually met Mandy at one of those focus groups last summer. <laughs> so it's kind of coming full circle now. We're, we're all really waiting to hear what the, the results are going to show. So really yeah. interested when that happens. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank anybody? You so much, sorry, Mandy, sorry. go ahead. No, just, just want to thank you so much for the responses. They have been very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Does anybody want to make a final comment? Um, uh, lots of people needing to leave and saying thank you. So thank you so much to our speakers. Thanks, Clinton. Anybody? Or is everybody just going off for lunch now? <laughs> Late lunch. Thank you so much to our speakers, to everybody in Trinity Inc. and for everybody who attended today. Um, it's great to see so many people here interested in this area. And please do keep in touch with us and um, in, in touch with our website to see what other events are coming up and how you can get involved. Thank you, everybody. Bye.